our friend Jerry Mayhew, who looks kind of dark with his hat on. Maybe you should uh, lean in a little bit or take that off. There you go. Um, I'm going to be taking you guys off the uh, uh, main screen here. I don't. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so I'm going to hold on one second here. Um, yeah, that's not what I want. No. Bear with me, guys. I'm... Uh, Trying to figure this back out. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. Um, pause sharing. Okay, stop share. There we go. Okay, so we're back here. Um, this is me and Jerry. We're talking about uh, spotted baby bass fishing. I'm going off the screen. We're trying to get us both on here. Um, the format of this video and, and webinar in general is that uh, we'll be talking, we'll be sharing a PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you have any questions, there is a place on your screen where you can uh, click on it and you can type in your question. Here I have a Q&A question already. Um, oh, hi Michael Moore, there you go. Good to see you on here and uh, hope you uh, find something good. So we're going to get started and uh, the whole presentation will last about 40, 45 minutes and we'll have some uh, time for questions at the end. If you have a question as we go, go ahead and click on it, type in your question, and we'll try to answer it as we're going along. Okay? So here we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, let me minimize this a little bit. Um, Spotted Bay Bass Techniques presented by Navionics, and I want to thank uh, them for giving us the opportunity to share this information with you guys. Um, what we're going to be covering tonight is uh, basically everything you need to know about Spotted Bay Bass Fishing. Technique specific tackle, uh, dock fishing presentations, eelgrass bed fishing presentations, uh, riprap, which is just rocky walls. Uh, mooring cans where boats are more uh, independent of docks and, and then channel edges. Um, if this doesn't make sense, we'll uh, be talking about it some more. And if this doesn't make I know I have a lot of experienced guys here logging on. I thank you guys for watching. Hopefully we can find something for you too. Um, so we're going to start out with the basics here, uh, talking about tackle. Um, Everybody has way too much fishing tackle when it comes to spotted bay bass, but we're going to talk about three basic presentations, and you can get by with three rods if you need to. If you're like me, you'll have 10 or 11. But at the top of the photo, you have a, uh, that's a five inch uh, Viejo swim bait on a boxer head on a light rod or medium action rod with 50 pound braid, 20 or 30 pound fluorocarbon. That would be your swim bait rod or spinner bait rod. You can throw a chatter bait, you can throw all, any, any matter of things we'll get into later. The middle rod is your crank bait, which is a big player when fishing spotted bay bass. And the bottom is your finesse rig. And this one here just has, I think, 10 or 12 pound fluorocarbon line with a ball head and a little zoom flute. Um, now, we're gonna step past this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody has any, uh, yeah, Jerry does look funny. Um, See my teeth? So I, I have questions already about tackle and stuff like that. We're going to get to that, uh, Steve Hub. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so basically, there's two categories of baits when you're fishing spotted bay bass. You have soft baits and you're going to have hard baits. Um, this picture is from several years ago, and I pulled it up because it kind of reminded me that I fish a little differently now than I did then. Uh, the top two baits are uh, seven inch uh, slugs, basically. It's the equivalent of a Berkeley jerk shad. These were made by MC. The top is rigged on a probably a half ounce boxer head. The second is rigged on an owner's sled head. These are uh, kind of the big end of baits you would fish. What's missing in this photo is that five inch Viejo size. I fish a lot on that same boxer head. Um, and you have a, a four inch or a three inch uh, regular swim bait on a Cody head or on an underspan, and then the bottom baits are uh, 
it's a swim jig with a skirt and a swim bait or a swim jig with a skirt and a creature bait. Um, and I'm kind of going to jump ahead here to the hard baits before we get into real discussion about this. Um, the only two real hard baits you have in spotted bay bass fishing are, are spinner baits and crank baits. Uh, the top two were uh, one ounce blade runner baits, uh, which are colors I've done well with, and the bottom two were a, uh, I believe those are Strike King <coughs> 6 uh, XDs. That looks like that, right? I, I don't yeah. remember, it was an older picture, but uh, yep. Yep. yeah, that uh, the uh, one is a shad color and the other one's a sexy shad, or, or one's a sexy shad and the other one's a parrot. Yep. Um, these are the baits that I would fish in that situation. I'm going to, uh, get away from uh, the sharing here for a minute. I'm going to talk to Jerry. And for you guys that don't know Jerry, Jerry is a, a, a licensed guide who runs trips on his boat. He's also the tournament director for the SBS tournament series. And a uh, longtime tournament angler who's won plenty of uh, spotted day bass events over the years. So I'm going to let you talk a little bit about the baits that you like to use and kind of go from there. Well, you know, we're talking about hard baits, <clears throat> um, spinner baits, crank baits. Uh, there's a lot of variations of both. Uh, it could be color, it could be size, uh, it could be how that bait gets down. Um, a lot of people, you know, believe in chucking and winding. <clears throat> I've learned one thing with uh, crank baits is when you fire a long cast, Initially, you don't want to burn that thing. A slow retrieve will get it down without getting it too close to you. The key is to get that bait down to the strike zone away from you so that most of your retrieve is in the strike zone all the way back to the boat. Um, a lot of different size crankbaits, you know, the XD6. Uh, I use a lot of finesse. You have a couple of examples? I, I do. Actually, I do. I have a, uh, this is really popular here, Bill Norman DD-22. I know a lot of people throw that one. Uh, I'll scale down even to a small, this is a Lucky Craft. This is a small little Lucky Craft crankbait. <clears throat> I'll literally crank this thing on a six or eight pound fluorocarbon. I'm a huge fluorocarbon guy when fishing spotties. Um, I'm going to tell you, just about every rod I throw in the bay for spotties is fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon sinks. You get a little more of a direct line to your bait and not a, you know, not a, not a uh, dome of an approach. Uh, so you're a little more direct with your bait. I fire this little guy on six pound test, eight pound test fluorocarbon, uh, as long of a cast as I can. Now if I'm fishing around structure, obviously I got to fish a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger. Um, but on the ends of docks, in moorings, um, when I first start to retrieve this little guy, it's a very slow retrieve until I get the bait down into the zone and going along the bottom, I'll go ahead and increase the speed. But the key is to get it down into the zone as far away from you as you can. So yeah, it's interesting that we have this conversation. You know, I thought that we fished pretty similarly. Uh, I was always taught that when that bait hits the water, you burn it as fast as you can to get it down and then you start your slower retrieve. So I guess, you know, in theory, your, your idea works better, especially with the fluorocarbon line. I, I strictly fish a, a Spectra to a fluorocarbon leader with my crankbaits. Um, you, you, so you're, the, the, the fluorocarbon line will allow this smaller bait to get down to the same depth as this bigger bait. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fluorocarbon sinks, you know, on a long cast, I'm gonna, crank real slow at first just to get so that thing to get down, down. Yeah. and then I can increase my speed once it gets into the zone once it gets once this thing gets into the zone it's going along the bottom and digging at a more of an increased speed to get that reaction out of a fish right but to maximize and utilize every single cast and, and the whole deal is to stack odds um, I want my cranking in the strike zone as long as I possibly can have it there so, right, it, it make, of, makes a little bit of a difference. And so, what, what size I have a question? What size reel are you throwing that bait on? I throw this on a Daiwa Tatula HD two hundred. Uh, any of like the 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 two hundred, one hundred, the three hundred's a little big. 
I like to go a little smaller with this bait. Now, what, what bait? I have another question here. What bait is that particular? This is a Lucky Craft. This is what they call, I think, a deep seven is what they call this. It's fairly small. And what did it dive to? Uh, this thing dives to nine feet. Uh, with fluorocarbon, you can get it to 10 or 11 feet. Okay. On a long cast, maybe a little bit deeper. Um, light line, for some reason, um, I'm a weird light line guy. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I learned, I'll tell you what, I learned a long time ago. Uh, fishing with guys like Al Mikolez, Rex McConnell, and some of my old buddies uh, in Newport Harbor fishing pavilion skips. And we used to troll shad wraps. And we would troll them with 10 pound tests. We'd get bites. As soon as we went to eight or even six, we'd get three times the bites wow. on the light line. Uh, I think it's just the efficiency of the, the, you know, not having a lot of resistance on the line, getting the bait in the strike zone and utilizing all that time down there where those so fish are going to bite. You more time to bite them. Absolutely. Now, I've got a couple, yes. of, got a couple of questions here. As far as floral, yeah. what brand, what, what brand of line are you fishing? Uh, you know, for the last year and a half, I've been fishing the Uzuri Top Knot uh, mainline and the Uzuri Fluorocarbon Leader stuff. Um, right. There's lots of great fluorocarbon. Seaguar makes great stuff. Um, you know, FC Sniper, there's a lot of great fluorocarbons. Personally, myself, uh, you know, in the last year, year and a half, I've been using a lot of the Azuri brand fluorocarbons. Okay. And, and they've been great. They've yeah, been really I, well. I like them a lot. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we're, you know, we have a question about water clarity, um, and we're going to kind of get into that a little bit more here in a little bit. So, um, regarding this, do you have other, any other baits that really stand out as baits that you like to fish? Oh, for spotted bay bass, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Spinner baits, underspins. Uh, this is a cool baits, underspin head right here. This, this is a cool baits. It's a cool baits underspin. It's got two bearings, two stainless bearings, one in the head and one below it. This bait right here, you can see, you can reel this bait very, very slow, and this blade's going to turn. Uh, which allows you this is a this is a jackal prism shad 3.8 swim bait on here. Uh, the Kitex, same thing, great little bait. Very finessey little. Very finessey. Yeah. Great for in the moorings. Great for on the docks. You slow, you slow roll and get plenty of action out of it. Absolutely yes. I like to fish this. Like I said, I'm a light line weirdo. Uh, anywhere from six to ten or twelve pound test. <laughs> yeah. I'm a weirdo. I, I, I pitch lay, but I, I pitch a lot of 40 pound gear and the 50 pound break. So, and, you know, I guess that's what you do better than I do. And, and, it, and it works. I yeah. mean, I've fished the spinnerbaits too on, you know, 20, 25 right. pound straight floral, like you said. Uh, right. Um, this is a, this is a war eagle. I'm going to, this is a secret. Okay. Don't Take tell notes, anybody. Guys. Take notes. I'm taking notes. Don't, don't tell anybody. This is a war eagle spinnerbait. It's got one silver and one gold blade. I believe this is a three ounce. This color right here is called mouse. Now for 20 years, I've thrown chartreuse shad, the very high visibility baits. Uh, when the water's clean, this bait right here, it's so finessey. It's very stealth. It's very stealth, yeah. it's very natural. When they're on that little fin bait, uh, this little war eagle spinner bait right here, uh, is money. This is one of my little. Do I have time to get one before Saturday's I, I, I got a couple in the garage for you. I got a couple in the garage. So, uh, but you know, I I love throwing the spinner bait. Uh, you can throw it in the open, around the docks, you name it. Uh, spinner bait's probably the most versatile spotty spinner bait. Nice. Uh, is, is 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 the bait of choice for me. All right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about baits. I've answered a few questions. There's plenty of times they have more questions later as they come up here. We're going to go back to our presentation of uh, what's happening. So, of course, I'm not doing it right again. Okay. So we've talked about the different baits we use. Um, so we're going to talk about the different type, types of areas you're going to fish spotted bay bass. And uh, the docks are a, a huge one, especially with people up, up here in – LA and Orange Counties. Uh, once you get down to San Diego, it, it don't uh, get uh, that. You know they, they get less coverage. But you know up here, docks are a, a good mainstay. In this picture, Matt is out in our little uh, twelve foot Livingston underneath, actually docking Newport Harbor. Um, 
So basically, a lot of guys fish docks and a lot of guys fish them very effectively, but a lot of people also miss a lot of the opportunity in the docks. And the most common way people fish the docks is to pitch to the piling on the end of the dock as the boat hit, or pitch to a piling that has a that is accessible to pitch to um, when there's not a boat in the docks, or maybe just pitch a bait into the shadow of a boat that's sitting in a dock. And you know, there's been plenty. I think Matt actually hooked a fish from this cast in subsequent photos I saved for this presentation. But basically, he's just casting. And if you guys can see my cursor here, into the into this dark area here where there's shadow around this piling, which may or may not hold the spot of bay bass that is looking to uh, uh, ambush a bait fish that comes by. He's fishing a small fluke on a ball head here, that, that one that was in the bottom of the earlier picture. And this stretch on this afternoon, when, we're, when I was taking these pictures, was wide open, and every end of the dock had a bite on it. Um, that is not always the case. In the best case scenario, you can just go down to the row of dock and get 30 or 40 fish. But in most cases, that's not going to work out like that. Um, so we need to talk about other aspects of the dock that people fish. Jerry, do you want to talk about how you approach a dock? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, um, there's a lot of different, you know, when you look at a dock, there's a lot of yeah. different configurations of a dock. Um, there's the end of a dock, like Eric was just describing, um, the shadow side, uh, the side where there was a boat. Uh, the shadow side, you know, just like we stack odds to catch these fish, these fish set up an ambush to better their odds to be able to take advantage of prey. So uh, we have to relate basically to what the fish's preferences are also. A lot of different angles in sides to docks. Uh, the ends of the docks, there's days where that piling holds a fish on every single dock. And then there's days where they're not on that thing, but they're eight feet back. And you got to skip under a dock rope between a boat and that little lane that's six inches between the dock and that park boat to get a bait back there and get a bite. Uh, if that's what it takes, so be it. Um, you've got to stay versatile and be willing to basically try to get every nook and cranny until you can discover where these fish are holding at any given time. So once you figure out that there are fish in the, you know, so these fish are basically staging a place where they can have the best access to bait fish that are coming by. You know, if they're on the end of the dock, that's easy for us. If they're six feet back and the bait is actually swimming under the docks, casting the end of the dock, they're not, they're not out there looking. Right. So once you figure out where they're at, you can kind of repeat that process. Absolutely. Yeah, so you and, don't, yeah. don't have to re reinvent the wheel every single dock. Right? That's right. And I've also noticed, too, on a falling tide, these fish seem to move out to the end of the dock and even out into the open out off the end of the dock. Um, and as the tide fills, these fish will push in towards the back and a little bit deeper on these docks, uh, which we're going to see some pictures yeah. here of where you're going to be able to get access to some of the back of these docks and we'll explain some of the angles and some of the presentations uh, you can use to catch fish behind the docks too. So we've got a couple of questions here before I move on. Uh, you know, first question, you're saying the docks in San Diego are less fishable or not as fish as much as Los Angeles? No, there's plenty of fish on the docks in San Diego, but there's down in San Diego, and this is something I'll talk about a little bit later, the fish are more oriented towards fin bait, which makes them not as structure centric as they are in Newport Harbor, for example. And if you go even further to Alamitos Bay or you go up to Santa Monica Bay or, or Long Beach Harbor, fish hold very tight to structure. The further south you go, the more they venture away from structure. So there's plenty of opportunity to catch fish on docks, but it's not an only, it's not an all or nothing thing down south. And the, uh, the, the next question is how long do we spend on one dock? It could be one cast, it could be five. If a dock has several good points that you're looking at, and that's something you develop throughout the day. If you, you know, if you make a cast to a piling that's in a particular position on a dock and you catch a fish, and you make a cast to another piling that's in the same orientation, and you get a fish on it, that's worth a couple of casts. 
if you're not catching anything, one or two pitches per dock, move on, keep going. Right? You agree with that? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen it where the guy in the back of the boat. I fished with Eric Bent before in Newport Harbor uh, with his dad, where Eric and his dad were in the front of the boat. They would hit a piling each side of it, make a cast down it. I was in the back of the boat. I'd swing a pitch in there, and for whatever reason, sometimes it takes multiple casts. Who's to get an interest? Benny's little partner, Keith. Uh, yeah, Michael. Keith Michael, uh, perfect example. I know that guy used to fish in Newport Harbor, master in there. Crankbaits, little grubs, little swim baits. Uh, he'd pull up on a dock and make eight or ten casts on it and hook a fish on his ninth cast. Now, do you have time in a tournament to utilize that? If you know that fish is there, change it up with a couple of different baits. Uh, if you don't get, if you can't get bit like that, uh, maybe those fish aren't holding. Uh, maybe initially in a pre-fish, uh, fish real methodically. Try a couple different baits. Try a couple different cadences or speeds um, to where you locate a fish uh, that you hook. Is he back far on there? Is he out near the end? What bait was it that got bit? You know, that's all part of the game of narrowing down and stacking your odds. Uh, but those little spotties are weird. Yeah, and you know, it's <laughs> funny. Maybe that comes down to a numbers game. You know, it might be a situation where you're fishing docks that you're going to get a bite every 50 good casts or every 100 good casts. So the trick is to make 500 casts in a day, and you'll get those, get those five bites that might – when you tournament or do well, it's it's an it's right. absolute number scheme. One of the best spotted baby bass fishermen there is, Eric Johnson, who doesn't fish tournaments anymore, thank God. I've watched him. He never stops the boat. It's pitch move, pitch move, pitch move, pitch move. He makes a thousand pitches in, you know, in a hundred yards, and he'll get a bite now and then. And, you know, there's been a lot of rumors about how he won these tournaments. It's because the guy just – Hits every potential spot that looks like it might have a spot of baby house on it. Extremely efficient. Being efficient with your time speed. So. Yeah. So the next thing, you know, this is something that, that I've always been big on. It's, it's fishing between docks. Just because you're around docks doesn't mean that every spot is associating with the dock. And um, in this picture here, Matt was, he cast his fluke out against the same rod he was using pitch and piling. He was working it back through open water a little faster than he would have. Basically, when you're pitching a piling, Pitch it out, it hits the bottom, you twitch a couple times, run it back and make your next pitch. Non-stop movement. Um, if you have open water like that, you can cast that bait out, or it could be a crankbait or a spinnerbait or a five-inch swim bait. Cast out the length and work it back. Bounce it up off the bottom, let it sink back, bang it along the bottom with the crankbait. There's plenty of fish out there. Do you have any input on that? Absolutely, yeah. Between docks, uh, what is the key element between docks? Sunlight. And in sunlight, you got eelgrass. So here you got a dock or two, and between those two docks, you got eelgrass. Sometimes those fish prefer to relate to the eelgrass. Uh, like Eric says, a crankbait, a spinnerbait, uh, something that can get through that eelgrass. Fish it faster. Uh, fish it a little bit faster or even slow. If the water right. temperature's cold, you know, you would, if the water temperature's cold, you'd go to an MC slug on a sled head or something that's weedless uh, in that grass bed. Now would you fish that, Gary? I would fire this thing out and basically hold my rod and uh, I would use my reel to advance the bait. Not so much my tip of my rod because when you're fishing a bait in the water, um, movement is exaggerated big time. I grew up swimming in a swimming pool and I'd go out all the time and I'd swim a jig or swim something through the pool and when it would settle to the bottom and I would hop it with my rod tip Boy, that thing would jump two or three feet. Right, yeah. But you if don't I held, how much you're moving it. Yeah, if I held my rod at like a 10 o'clock position and just use the handle of my reel to barely advance the bait, it would slide through that stuff way more naturally yeah. than if sometimes, now, now mind you, sometimes they like that erratic deal. Yeah, it, might, um, it gets a, 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 a reaction bite. Correct. Whereas, uh, they might eat it that way that day. Uh, a lot of times, I'll uh, I'll use the rod just to slide it through the stuff. And I know guys like Jimmy Decker. Yeah, he loves fishing Newport. He'll fish a half ounce or three quarter ounce uh, lead head or sled head uh, with a jerk shad, and he will slide that thing through the silt or the sand, yeah. create a little bit of a puff off the bait. But it it moves, but it's not super erratic. Those yeah. fish come Very in subtle. on that thing and and they eat it. 
It looks like yeah. a bait fish almost feeding on the bottom or just swimming trying to stay out of the uh, hard way there. Very natural. But anyway, the eelgrass, uh, lots of different ways that the eelgrass, we're going to get into that. Yeah, we're going to get into that here. Yeah. Um, so going back to our presentation here, so you know, we're fishing between docks, uh, basically whenever you're fishing dock situations, I would try everywhere. Don't cast towards the dock, cast away from the dock. I turn around and cast an open water behind me. You know, those fish are going to be somewhere. Once you find them, they'll likely be there along most of the docks. If you get more than one or two, you can develop a pattern and you can follow that through. It might be a presentation, it might be a speed of retrieve, size of bait, amount of vibration. You know, we, we, throw, the, we throw the kit. Something, uh, yeah, and something I do also is as the boat is advancing down a row of docks, I'm going to cast ahead of the boat in the direction where the boat is drifting or working. Or going, yeah. Correct. Sometimes those fish are a little bit worried about boat presence. Yeah, they don't let's, want you to yell. Yeah, let's fire a cast way down the edge of the docks where the boat is going to be in two yep. minutes and see if we can't get a fresh fish off of an, an unmolested or... And if you've got in the back of the boat, cast back four or five pilings and uh, get on the back end of it. Absolutely, yes. Yep. So, you know, and that talks about getting creative. And um, yes, as sir. you can see here, Red, this is Matt in the living room, up in about six inches of the water probably <laughs> fishing up on your dog. I don't think we caught anything there. But, you know, it, it, there, you never know where these things are going to be. And you were talking about on the incoming tide, a lot of times these flies will move up shallow. Absolutely. To take advantage of whatever is just recently covered with water. Uh, yeah. Matt and I were fishing the SWBA uh, Spotted Bay Bass Tournament Mission Bay uh, this past year. And we found a bite in eelgrass that was no joke in six to eight inches of the water. You would cast an eel, you're basically casting to the shore. And like Jerry said, and we had the, the, the small fluke on a bullhead on 10 pound fluorocarbon, and we would move it so slow that it almost seemed ridiculous. But every almost every cast of the bite, and we probably had, and we, we only weighed. I think four legals in a tournament or whatever. There were so many fish who were just shy. Um, and we actually, had a, we thought we had a limit until I went back and measured a couple of my guys. Oh, that's not even close to me. But um, there were teams that had, um, they would pull up, they would fish next to us with normal presentations and get no bites at all. And if they were just like, we're doubled up the entire day. Doesn't pull up, cast 50 times, not catch any leaf. Because we were casting shallow these small baits and barely moving them like Jerry was talking about. Correct. So. Correct. This, this little, uh, I don't know if you can see the cursor here, this piling on the inside of this dock right here, this is a little sweet spot right here on an incoming or a full tide. Um, you know, you would set up somewhere over here or where Matt is and get a cast, an underhand cast out beyond it, and reel a spinner bait or an underspin or a small swimmy, a five-inch viejos, whatever it is, I lost my cursor there. But that's a sweet spot right there on a high tide situation. Um, so it's a good ambush point for a, for a fish to be. It's a great ambush point. The, these fish are sitting under this part of the dock on an incoming tide, looking in towards the bank. Okay, they're going to move up into this shallow stuff. This stuff's all going to be underwater here. All this is going to be underwater. This is a last point of contact before it gets too shallow. So this is a very good sweet spot right here. Um, I fished another time with Eric Bent. We were in my champion fishing Newport Harbor, and uh, the tide was favorable to where we could get, you know, under these docks. We'd go under the dock. Eric was in the front skipping and pitching his tube. He's a master yeah. at that. The guy's really good at getting a bait under docks. Uh, I sat in the back of my own boat with a spinner bait, and uh, I would cast to the back corner and basically get – what I call a reverse angle. Right, yeah. On these docks. The boat would literally pass through the area. And you're tugging around it. Correct. Yeah. And I'd fire and get my line to come underneath the back edge of the dock. And I had multiple days like that where, you know, you'd make some casts on it, they wouldn't bite, you'd get the boat beyond it, you get a weird angle on it, and boom, they would bite the spinnerbait for whatever reason. Right. Uh, some days are like that. So you gotta, you got to move around, got to keep an open mind and try everything. So I just had a question about casting yoga grass and uh, reeling through it. And this is, we're going to talk a lot about this. This is my friend Dre. This is on uh, Corey Sandin's boat down in Mission Bay. Uh, we were down here doing a photo shoot a couple of years ago. And uh, he is just off the beach of Piesta Island. And we caught several fish through this little stretch right here. And uh, I went ahead and uh, made a graphic 
using a Navionics chart showing what the area we were fishing looked like. So basically there's a huge yellowgrass bed that's here. It probably extends quite a bit past here, but I just used this part of it for the, uh, for the demonstration. Um, and each of these lines is a, a drop off in depth. So you can see it drops off fairly quickly here from the shore out and then gets flat for a while and then it gets basically flattens out. And on that day, the current was going out, which means that it was pulling water in a direction of the arrow. The uh, eelgrass was laid in that direction. The fish we caught were in two locations that morning. They were on the edge of that drop off, which I think is in about six feet of water. It goes from shallow. It's kind of like I was talking about in that, that tournament, Matt, my fish. Um, but you know, you could sit and cast in towards the island here and catch a fish every 15 minutes, 20 minutes, get a bite, or you could cast parallel to the shoreline and get bites every couple casts. And what it is, is you're actually effectively working a, a drop off that associates with an eelgrass bed. So those those fish are feeding on bait fish that are swimming between the shoreline and the eelgrass bed or are getting pushed down by the current. And they're also on, on the outside edge of that. There's bait fish getting pushed through the middle of the eelgrass bed as well. But that's a low percentage spot. Imagine this is a kelp bed rather than eelgrass bed. The fish are going to be on the leading edge of it or the outside or inside edge of it. Absolutely. And when it comes to spotted bay bass, where well, calicos are more likely on the leading edge and outside edge, with spotted bay bass are usually on the leading edge and inside edge. So by sitting there and just working that depth edge, which you know you get on your Navionics chart, there's multiple fish to be caught through there. Whereas the rest of this big bed here, you can catch fish through there, but it's gonna be a much lower percentage. Right, those are gonna be isolated fish, more so than fish stacked up within a sweet area. Actively feeding. Right. Um, so, you know, we have a question about how do we work our bait on that drop off into the yield grass. Uh, and we also have a question about how we, do we, we wind the bait through the yield grass or right above it. Basically what we're doing is we're working it parallel. We're trying to find the edge of that grass or where the grass needs to drop off, that little channel there where those fish are really sitting because the baits can be funneled through there. And you don't want to fish a bait that kind of swims through or over it. Uh, Jerry showed you the slug on the uh, owner lead head, the sled head. Um, a spinner bait, uh, spinner bait. an underspin, anything that doesn't have hooks hanging off the bottom, you're usually good on. And basically what I'll do is I'll make a long cast, let it sink to the bottom, fish with my rod tip up, and wind the bait, unless it's a slow period, like you're talking about, but wind the bait so it's skipping over the top of the eelgrass, because that's what bait fish would do. The bait fish are not going to be dug down in the eelgrass, they're going to be riding over the top of and in warm water times, a very good retrieve to use in there is to pop it up out of the grass by casting out, letting it sit to the bottom, make two or three quick lines to handle with your rod tip high, letting the bait sink back down, and repeating that, that just gets the predatory response of those fish to bite. Right, right. Now, Eric's talking about, uh, you know, this bait fish moving through just above the grass, not so much in it. So your presentation, whether it be a spinnerbait or a crankbait, you have to be very familiar and very dialed in with the diameter of your line fishing and the weight, say, of your spinnerbait. Uh, if I'm throwing a 3 8 ounce spinnerbait, 12-pound uh, test, this bait's going to settle a little bit deeper on a retrieve than it would if I was throwing 15-pound fluorocarbon. Um, you really got to dial in and get that feel. The last thing you want is the blades on your spinnerbait getting fouled up by eelgrass. Yeah. So the key is to keep it right above, just on top of that eelgrass. Same thing with a crankbait. I know guys that they're, 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 they're crazy about the, the line they fish. Uh, it determines the running depth of their bait. Uh, this well, you know, the crankbait, if you know exactly how deep your crankbait runs, you're seeing 11 feet of water, and you know you can get that bait to run at 10 and a half feet, you're going to kill them. You're, yeah. gold, you're golden. That's right. And that's just becoming familiar with the baits you're confident with and the line you prefer. Uh, like I said, if the tide's higher, you know, I would throw this spinnerbait on, on 10 or 12 pound or 14 pound floral. Uh, if it's shallow, I'd go 15, 20, 
even 25 the pound tire. Yeah, just to keep the bait above the grass from that shallow. And as you're retrieving, that bait seems to settle a little bit more. So you're raising your tip a little bit during the course of that. That's exactly right. That, that's a big thing. You know, when, to keep your bait horizontal in that right zone. If you're fishing in, in 10 feet or less of water, the angle you hold your rod in has a huge effect yeah, on how your bait fits. If you have your rod tip into water or at water level, your bait will fish five feet deeper than it will if you hold your rod at the 45 degree angle. That's right. And you know you can get used to that. You can feel the grass when you hit it. So you basically, what I'll do is I'll hold my rod at an angle and keep my retrieve steady, so I can feel the bait hitting the grass but not fouling the grass. Right. And it it sounds complicated, but once you spend an hour doing it, it's right. super easy. Right. As as your bait gets closer to you, your tip kind of drops down a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. So you have to compensate for that. Exactly. Yeah. It's just so like you, you got to compensate for that angle of retrieve. Right. Between your tip and the bait. So that's all about stacking odds and keeping your bait in the strike zone the entire time. Yeah. So, super important. Okay, so we're getting into riprap fishing here. Um, we're going a little bit uh, quicker, a little slower than I thought, so I'm going to try and pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, <laughs> we can talk for weeks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was one of the problems I figured we'd have. You know, spotted bay bass associate with rocks. And rocks, there are rocks in every single harbor. Um, Long Beach Harbor has become a, a giant spotted bay bass hotspot. Uh, it's tough, um, but you know the thing is with spotted bay bass, is there's plenty that associate with riprap, but there's not enough spotted bay bass associating with riprap that you can pull up and catch them. Uh, you have to cover water, and you know it's uh, uh, going back a few years ago. The the tournament that Matt and I won in uh, in Long Beach Harbor, we picked a stretch of riprap. And it was a three fish tournament. We said we need three fish. We caught plenty of fish pre fishing. We said that, you know, we're going to find an area, we're going to work that through the entire tide cycle. These fish move up and down this riprap. They're not sitting in one spot like they were in a boring can or pilot. They actually actively swim up and down. I said, you know, during this tide cycle, we will have an opportunity to catch three fish. We actually got four fish, and the entire bite we had lasted about 12 or 13 minutes out of an eight hour tournament, but it was enough to get seven something for three fish and uh, won the tournament. But, you know, we didn't have the luxury of running miles of riprap due to the fact that there was a bunch of other teams there. So we had to pick one section and hope that we got lucky enough to have those fish swim through. Um, one of the biggest mistakes people make when fishing riprap is not getting the boat close enough to the rocks. Uh, in this picture, it looks like they're fishing fairly close to the rock, but it, it's probably tough to see the Fish finder, they're, they're in 41 feet of water, 15, 20 feet from the from the shoreline. They're not going to catch any spotted bay bass there. They might catch a sand bass. They might catch a halibut uh, or a bonita. But, you know, they're currently, and I, I pulled the boat out to take this picture to show how it dropped off. But casting that way, your bait is in the bite zone for maybe 15 or 20 seconds from your cast until it's too deep or too far away from structure to get bit. So you really need to get right up on the structure. And in this photo, you can see how close we are. Um, Long Beach Harbor drops off faster in a lot of spots. But if I'm sitting in more than 10 feet of water or 12 feet of water, I don't feel I'm, I feel I'm too far away from the rocks. And I mean, sometimes it is, you can touch the rocks with your rod tip. But it's usually calm in there. But you can see your mask got a fish on a crankbait. I think that was a nice spot that you got. And, um, casting parallel to the riprap and finding a depth to run your bait where it's coming in contact with the rocks. Be it a spinner bait, a bigger swim bait. We'll fish the five inch videos. So I've got fish on a seven inch bait in there. A crank bait, um, Alabama rig, which is great. I don't fish unless I'm fishing a tournament because it just killed me. But um, you want contact, you want noise, you want commotion. Um, and I, I, Rowan here, choose lures to allow you to cover water quickly. Um, it's funny, I took uh, Eric Bent from the SWBA uh, to pre-fish Long Beach Harbor before last year's finale. And after 15 minutes of fishing, he kind of stopped fishing because none of the baits he brought allowed him to fish them properly as fast as I was moving the boat. Um, so basically, I have the boat going 
at enough speed that I have to wind as fast as I can with whatever lure to keep the to bait. work it normally to keep the bait at the right yeah. speed. And right. Right. so, Jerry, you want to talk about? Yeah, no, and, and it, you know that all makes sense. Uh, here's here's a level of adjustment that you need to consider. Like Eric says, get in tight, get your bait in the zone. You want to keep it in the zone as long as you can. That's stacking your odds. But at the same time, now you got to kick your trolling motor up another speed, another yeah. notch, um, because you are now grinding that bait through that zone. And before you know it, uh, you know, if you're going too slow, you're just basically pinning the bottom over and over yeah. again. I'm a firm believer in fresh spot fresh fish yeah so keep the boat moving so that every long cast the first third of that cast is a fresh zone yeah uh, with a spinnerbait or a crankbait or a swim bait, whatever it is but when you're covering water then you got to move you got to keep the boat moving especially when you're in tight like that well it's funny Matt and I during the with last year's SW, no, the previous year's SW finale they had a extra points for spotty double weight we caught some big sand bass in the morning we had the biggest wave, but uh, a bag of all spotty feet, but we wanted one spotty, and we went into a stretch of Long Beach Harbor where there's about a mile and a half of riprap. And I said, I'm going to put the trolling motor on high, and we're going to just hammer this, both of us fishing those that striking 616 and sexy shad. Or actually, it's in root beer color in there that we're creating. It's another secret I'm sharing with you guys. Um, it got to the point where after – 30 minutes, we had to take turns laying on the deck because our backs and our shoulders and everything were so screwed up while the other person kept. But we got, a, you know, a two-pound something spotty that was almost a five-pound bass in our total bag. But, you know, there was we got two legal fish in a mile and a half, but we had to absolutely cast as far as we could and wind as fast as we could with our trolling motor set like four yeah. going against the current, which is, I mean – probably close to a mile an hour, maybe a little faster than that even. I don't, I'm not even sure, but it, it's like if you cast out and you don't want, you're going to be on top of your bait in 30 seconds. Right. So you you're just, you're, you're going to tire yourself out yeah. with that kind of an approach, but it is effective at covering water, and you do whatever it has to. Uh, you can complain all you want. You can lay on the deck, but uh, yeah, you're, you're in a tournament. So if you're, you're gonna, catching a check, you know, it's you're, all you're, worthwhile. You can do whatever you have to. And yeah. then you can lay down after the yeah, horse exactly. with that plaque <laughs> on your chest. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so, you know, one of the other things that comes down to you when fishing any riprap anywhere is look for irregularities. In this photo here, Matt is fishing a corner, and they actually filled – this is in Lobby Charter. They filled it all in to put a parking lot, and this spot is gone. This spot was so money, and I'm sure that some of you guys see that and real, recognize it for what it was. But anytime the tide was coming in, the fish would stack up right here on this corner and cast across it was guaranteed a spotty or a big sand bass. Um, irregularities aren't always structural. They could be a school of bait that you see. You know, there's going to be a lot of bait. And every time I'm driving, I'm looking in the water. Is there, is there bait? Does it look happy? Does it look scared? Is it relaxed? Is it fall up in small things? Um, and I have a question here about are, are they sensitive to the boat? The, 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 Ninety-nine percent of the time, the spotted bay bass in harbors don't associate boats with predation because there's so much boat activity there yes. that they're not worried about. It. It's it's not it, they're not. It, it's like you know we'll, we'll drive around with their stereo on full blast, listening to rap music, and and you know keep the main motor running and still get bites. But no, um, so if you see spots of scared bait if you see irregularities in the shoreline jerry shared something earlier we were talking about um something that you see at rip rap that you yeah you know you can be going down a, a long length of this rip rap uh it might be a straight run 100 yards and then you got one little weird patch of vegetation uh that would hold a, a school of bait or something on it any kind of irregularity like eric says that point right there is money Anything different, uh, you need to investigate it and approach it with the confidence that you're going to get bit. That having the confidence you're going to get bit often does result in a bite. Especially with reaction baits. Absolutely. Because reaction baits, honestly, is about 95% confidence in what you're throwing. So here we have the, uh, the guy with the best uh, hair in sport fishing, that that Corey Shannon. That hair is good, right? It's there. amazing. Yeah, it's a great Corey. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's got a, a very nice uh, spotted bay bass here on a, uh, on a guppy spin uh, Blade Runner spinner bait. 
in Morin, Kansas, in San Diego. And, you know, um, he really taught me how to look at Morin, Kansas differently. I, you know, I was under the impression that every moored boat had a rope going down or two ropes going down that was associated with an anchor block on the bottom that may or may not have a spotted bay bass associated with it. You can pitch a bait to or drag a bait across and maybe get a bite. What he taught me is that there's not really, there are fish on those, but there's plenty of other spots where fish can be on any given day. So when you're going to look at a big mooring field, this is a shot from Google Earth to kind of give you a better perspective of it rather than on the water. All these boats that are pointed in this direction will point in another direction later when the tide goes the other direction. They'll swing a 360. Um, there's, you know, let's say there's 50 boats there. There's 50 mooring cans that could potentially have a spotted bay bass on them. But I think that, you know, a spotted bay bass sitting on a mooring can in the middle of this thing here by the thing where my cursor is has a pretty low percentage of having something swim by and be able to capture that. So pitching every mooring can would probably be pretty unproductive. If the tide's going in, these ones out here might have fish on them or those there might have fish on them, but the rest of them probably don't. So there's probably plenty of fish in those cans. You just need to figure out how to find them. And, you know, one of the biggest things lately in the last two years has been look for bait schools. And there's these ducks, these tiny little ducks that are the grebe. They're, they're little, I call them puff puff birdies. Yeah. They're smaller than a grebe, and then you got the grebes. Yeah. And uh, they're focused uh, on fin bait. Yeah. And those, those, those things, we found them in Newport. We found them in San Diego Bay. We found them. Throughout the year, and it's it's funny. You can pull up, you can see them diving, and I've cast out a five-inch bait, put the reel in gear when it hit the water, and ten feet down, I've got a spotted bay bass in twenty feet of water in the middle of nowhere. Right. These birds are associating with bait that's getting chased to the surface, and the things they're chasing at the surface are often spotted bay bass. That's right. Um, in Newport Harbor, I've had days where I'll pull up the, the diving ducks and get twenty fish. You know, they're not all legals, they're most of them but I mean, it's every cast. But if you don't see that, what you're going to look for is boats on the edges, the up current or side edges of the mooring bed, or mooring cans that sit around hillgrass, like Jerry was talking about earlier, or mooring cans where you're marking bait. And Jerry and I were talking about before the seminar, um, side imaging makes such a huge difference now because not only can you see grass that's under a moored boat, 50 yards away, you can see bait schools above it or scattered bait around this area. Um, these fish are there to feed. They want to eat every single day. So they're going to be looking um, for bait fish. So if you have current and you have bait fish and you have some kind of structure, be it the shadow of a board boat, some yellow grass, a mooring can, any of these things, these things will congregate or aggregate these fish. That you can right. I've uh, you know, like, you know, and, and I will say, you know, over the course of the last eight or 10 years, uh, it seems like we have a little more silt uh, in our harbors. I think a lot of these fish are keying on fin bait more than they have in, re, you know, in past times. Um, I've seen this personally myself in a mooring field um, in Newport Beach. Uh, I've seen spotties up suspended next to the keel of a sailboat seven or eight feet below the surface on a water on a day where the water's clean and clear and you can see down you know eight ten feet um these fish are sitting in ambush waiting for small fin bait schools to come by um, and they're using shade instead of shade on the shade side whatever it might be but a rigs you know crankbaits swim baits underspins whatever all those baits power uh, fishing you're covering have, a lot of water they have the ability to catch those fish and uh they don't necessarily have to be on the bottom. Uh, I've seen spotties up on a piling, uh, eight, ten feet up off the bottom. Oh, yeah, you'll cast on a pilot until they get bit to stand against the water. How many times yeah. did you get bit? Just like you said, exactly. I mean, you got on that bite in San Diego Bay, you yeah. fire out and on a tight line about six or ten feet down, boom, you yep. get they're there over they're 20 feet. You know, they're, they're bass. They're, so, you, know, you can get sand bass on the surface. You can get so, galligals on the bottom. Open water fish, uh, they can be on the bottom. Uh, I think more of those fish uh, – orient to the you know uh mid to lower sometimes even upper column depending, depending on, on the conditions. 
depending on what the mate's doing. So keep an open mind. Don't really, yeah. don't necessarily go into spot of baby that's fishing today the same way you did two or three years ago because you're going to be disappointed. That's right. Um, Those fish haven't gone anywhere. They're still there. They're just changed the Yeah. Map. Now speaking of that, you know, there's a there's an there's a aspect of spotted baby bass fishing that most people don't really pay any attention to at all, and that's fishing channel edges and significant depth changes. Um, spotted baby bass don't necessarily relate to hard bottom or sandy bottom that drops off, but what they do do is feed on bait fish that do. And there's a bunch of arrows showing on this thing here. And each one of these arrows is pointing to an area where the bottom drops off between two and 10 feet in a very steep manner. And if you're unfamiliar with Navionics charts, each of these lines is a, is, a, is a depth change. So the closer the lines are together, the more rapidly the depth changes. And it might be feet, as you can see close to the docks here, it probably drops five or six feet in, you know, in 20 feet. Um, these edges create funnels of current, which the bait get pushed towards. It's almost like it speeds up the current because it's, it's you know, it's like a, the wind coming down a hill or going up a hill increases in speed. So current water movement does the same thing. It rushes faster. That faster rushing creates a vacuum that sucks bait fish up against these edges. Just they're, they're not stuck to it. They're just, if they're swimming naturally, they're going to get pushed over towards those edges, and the fish are going to be there to feed on them. And the far right arrow is something that Jerry was talking about. Um, yeah, I've seen, you know, this, this, this arrow here. I don't know if you guys are familiar. This is Balboa Island on the south shore of Balboa Island, this whole stretch right here. Um, a little bit of time ago, I was on an unbelievable spinnerbait bite here. Uh, but, you know, even a, even a spot like this with this little channel, uh, on an outgoing tide is going to have current coming out here. It's going to eddy up on each side of, uh, of uh, where's my cursor? Uh, there we go. Each side of this entry. Just that pull out, spin out. Correct. Yeah. It's going to spin like a weird old-fashioned mustache right. on both sides of this uh, uh, entry to that, uh, that area there. But this stretch also has a lot of docks with that break on it. Uh, where it drops off right on the edge of those docks. can be very, very good. Uh, this will host fish on both a low and a high tide. Uh, and those fish are there not because of the docks so much as because of the, there they chose those docks because there's right. that access, that quick drop off, which follows bait fish. Absolutely, yes. It, it offers the best, best of both worlds actually here. So uh, a really good stretch. If it bites uh, and it's on, it's it can be very good. But, uh, you know, here's, that's, that's a do. Great example to have, uh, you know, docks and that break along with that. And yeah, I'm sure there's a million places like that in Newport Harbor, uh, but so that's a great example of, of what bites. And you know, and also the, these bigger channels in the middle. Anywhere there's a, a, a quick drop off, there's going to be a, an aggregation of bait fish, um, and there's going to be fish that are feeding on it. And I've had by this arrow here, um, I had fished these morning cans and caught some fish and. I saw a guy drop, troll back and forth with his kids and catch like five really big spotted bay bass in the middle of nowhere. And I drove out to see what it was, and there was a channel edge. And I drove along that channel edge, and I marked bait schools with my side imaging and casting those bait schools. I caught spotted. Um, those fish are out actively feeding. You know, they're not sitting on a dock or sitting on a mooring can. Those fish are active fish. I mean. Everybody associates spotted bay bass with these structural rated fish here, in, at least in Orange and LA counties. But if, once you get down to warmer areas, they focus strictly on open water. And you go down to uh, Mag Bay and cast anything anywhere, and you get the spot in the middle of nowhere. You know, they're not, yep. they're not what people think they are. So the more they focus on fin bait, the more they become free range, and they're no longer associating with the, with the spots they would have if they're eating crustaceans. Or waiting in ambush for the, the rare bit of fin bait. Right. Plus um, these plus these fish, uh, they're in an active feeding mode. They're positioning on these creep channels or these channel edges uh, in pursuit. They're they're in a feeding mode. So if you can find them and get them, they're going to be biting there. Yeah, they're going to bite them out there. They're going to be biting. They're going to bite. You might be fishing a stretch of docks that looks great, and there's but fish it, there, but, but there's not, no feeding fish there currently. Yeah, they're not biting then. You know, that's, yeah. that's if you can fish, find fish away from the structure, they're going to bite. Right. 
Uh, I have a question about screen grabs of what bass look like on the side scan. You're not going to see spotted bay bass on the side scan where, where you're going to see his bait. And, and wherever you fish, be it for yellowtail, be it for spotted bay bass, sand bass, calicos, barracuda, whatever, if you mark bait and it marks very evenly, that's happy bait. It's the same bait you see swimming in a kelp. It's like, yeah, everything's great. I love being a sardine. I'm having good thoughts. Yeah. You want bait that looks like it's having a bad day. If you see in the water, it should be shooting away from the boat. It should be in small groups. It should be in three or four bait fish swimming very quickly in a certain direction. On the meter, it will show it's broken. So if you're marking, uh, and a lot of times these baits, there'll be a lot of bait in there. You just get a fuzz of bait as you're going along. And suddenly that fuzz is suddenly broken up and the chunks and missing. There's probably feeding going on right there. and It may not be spotted bay bass, but it could be in for a few cats. Yep. Um, you know, I, again, I, this is brought to you by Navionics, and I am uh, speaking on their behalf, but I'll tell you what, I didn't think about a lot of this stuff until I got the charts that showed me this stuff. And, and what's funny is to see on the chart, like this arrow here, relating to an area where I've caught spotted day bass on a drop-off without realizing the extent of that drop-off. I might have thought that was a little ledge. I didn't know that was a ledge that runs the length of the harbor, basically. And on any good, given day, it has biting bass along it somewhere. Um, these are just things to, things to consider. So uh, we're hitting kind of towards the end of things here, and uh, I'm going to open up for questions. I've got one here. Um, about Spotty's diets, uh, there's, you know, the, the question is, is there, are Spotty's more keyed in on fin bait during the summer and then during the fall and winter, they're more into crustaceans? You know, eight years ago, I would have said yes. Six years ago, I would have said yes. The crazy El Nino and global warming, whatever you want to call it, uh, North, uh, North Pacific blob thing we've had going here, nothing is normal anymore. I believe that the spotted bay bass in San Diego are biting like the spotted bay bass in uh, Mag Bay. I believe that the spotted bay bass in Newport are now biting like the spotted bay bass in San Diego. Uh, I think they're all keyed in on fin bait and they're all acting a little differently. Uh, we have a question about water clarity. Uh, Water clarity is not a big issue unless you have bluebird skies and a high sun. Clear water, you're going to get bit better early and late. And the more clear the water is, the more likely the fish are going to be associating with shade or structure. Absolutely. Sometimes wind will break up that surface Absolutely, too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yep. Now, uh, as far as plastics, any colors that tend to work better? Boy, sometimes they like the, the bright stuff. I'm a natural guy. I love to throw the natural stuff, the, you know, the blue grunion stuff, uh, the lighter shades. Uh, but I've seen it many times where they react really good to fire tiger. Right. Uh, it depends. You, you know, if you're sitting in the boat with your buddy and you're in a pre-fish situation, gosh, what if you throw one thing, the other throw something different? It's not going to hurt anything. Um, leading up to tournament day. The key to pre-fishing isn't about catching a ton of fish. You just want to distinguish what a fish's preferences are. Uh, many times I've gone and pre-fished and not caught a single fish, but I've recognized something by the end of the day. Come tournament day, I'll go in and make that adjustment, and uh, a lot of the times I'm, I'm on them. And, and uh, You know, it's all about making adjustments. Too. Yeah. You've got to keep an open mind. And, you know, it would, you know, in, in one of the, uh, along with those same terms, you can never go wrong with a, a natural color like that or like this. Um, if it's really dirty water, you can use a brighter color, but you don't have to. Right. Um, I showed you this mouse, yeah. uh, War Eagle Spinnerbait. This is a clear water bait, way more so than an off color bait uh, or an off color, uh, uh, you know. But, yeah, yeah. With, with, you know, and then you look at a crankbait like this, it looks very bright. But, you know, I don't think that the color of that is really attracting the fish so much as the motion. And, you know, I, I've kind of, at least for myself and other, and other bass species, I've proven, you know, for the last three or four years, all I've fished is green flake top with a gold flake belly for calico bass, sand bass, spotted bay bass, everything I'm fishing swim baits for, and I catch fish. I, know, I, I don't know that something wouldn't work better. 
but I know that it works fine ninety percent of the time. Right, and we discussed too that any kind of a reaction date, uh, you have to be confident in it. Uh, I've watched Kevin Van Damme oh, at yeah. Mission Viejo throw a spinnerbait in the cleanest water you could imagine. Uh, that guy is such a master and he's so confident at throwing reaction baits. He's able to catch eight and ten pound fish in yeah. crystal clear water. It, it's all mental. Uh, it's, 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 it's believe in your camp. I mean, I can't, you know, there's been a hundred times where either me or Matt is 100% on and the other one will throw the same bait and not catch anything or catch one fish to the other person's tent. Right. Uh, you know, you know you're going to get bit before that bait hits the water. Find those baits and fish those baits. Yep. And it, that's really all you need to do. You know, you don't need to look much past that. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, and uh, we're at the one-hour mark here. So I'm going to be uh, sharing one more thing here. Um, and I, first of all, I want to thank Jerry for helping me here, but I want to thank you guys all for attending my webinar. I'm going to be uh, randomly uh, – everybody's name goes into a spreadsheet here. I'm going to pick the name of uh, three people, and I'm going to send them a, a one-year gift certificate to uh, Pacific Coast Sport Fishing Magazine to uh just for attending and um i'm hoping that some of you guys that are seeing this might come by and uh and fish jerry's turn on saturday it's in newport beach yeah and you're all welcome even if you can't make the event if you have plans or uh you know you're, you're not up to fish in the event uh, you're welcome to come down check out the weigh-in at three o'clock uh eat some barbecue off the traeger grill you know converse with all the guys that are fishing in the tournament and uh, it's a it's a good time yeah, they are interested. It starts at uh, 5 a.m., show at 4. Uh, right. Show they, up a little bit early. We anticipate to be quite a few uh, rookie family teams this year. We're we'll talking a little bit about what you're doing there. Yeah. You know, this year, uh, you know, we've incorporated a master's division, which has all the established tournament guys. Uh, Eric would definitely be considered a master. <laughs> uh, a lot of you guys that have tournament experience or have, you know, cut a couple checks in the last few years. Um, that's would be considered masters. We have a lot of teams uh, that have been, I, I'm not going to say intimidated, but have been a little bit on the fence about just jumping right in and fishing against guys like Eric and Matt, guys like Jimmy and Tracy, and some of the more established or me teams. And Jimmy in this one. Or you and yeah. Jimmy in this one. Uh, so rookies get in. Your entries are a little bit less. Uh, they're $100 basic entry, $25 for options. Uh, rookies fish against rookies, masters fish against masters. Each division gets their own accolades. Uh, I have sets of plaques for each. Uh, everybody uh, that qualifies for the year championship um, gets recognition through either division. A lot of the prizes I give away at the end of the year from trips to Cedros in Alaska, uh, Mercury 115 four-stroke motor, Motor guy, trolling motor, three Traeger grills. I've given away a bunch of stuff. Um, so if you can get into the SBS here this year, that's great. You got to you only have you only have fish four events. There's five, so you take four best. If you only make four, that's still good. Um, but yeah, it'd be great to see you. And like I said, if you can't fish the events, that's okay too. Uh, I just like to see you come on down at the weigh-ins. Uh, they're always fun. And again, that's in Newport Harbor, the winds at the Dunes parking lot there, right? Three o'clock at the top yeah, of the ramp. Uh, we had a question about that. We got a, a red room is coming down from Santa Barbara, having to drive 305 miles to get to Newport <laughs> due to the uh, mudslides. Thanks oh, for tuning boy. in. Uh, uh, Brian and Whitney, right? I yeah, I got a question about uh, any thoughts on hookup baits. They work great. Um, I know plenty of big fish have been caught on them. And um, just like anything else, they they have their role. They're not the uh, end all answer to everything, but they definitely do have their place. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us. If there's any other questions, I've got a couple more minutes here. Uh, thank you, John Cadlec, Cadlesic, for uh, your tuning in there from uh, South Carolina, apparently. Nice. And uh, nice. nice. We uh, appreciate you viewing. Hope you guys learned something, and uh, hope to see a few of you on uh, Saturday. So uh, that's about